Yeah, how you guys doing? Um, I've been a, uh, a wrestling fan, a comic book fan, since I was like eight years old, and uh, there was never to me any really good wrestling comics. Um, you know, there were a lot of Undertaker fighting demons and you know, WWE type things that people would people would license WWE comics when wrestling was hot to try to you know cash in or whatever. But there was never any books about wrestling, so uh, you know I just decided to make one myself. Um, and uh, it's the story of a kid who's a theater major in college, and he falls in love with wrestling sort of unexpectedly, and he, uh, he, he takes over his life, and he quits school, and he decides he wants to become a wrestler. And uh, it's his story, sort of learning the business. We're examining the craft of wrestling through the eyes of a performance artist, but at the same time, he's sort of navigating like the underbelly of the business, trying to get to the bright lights in the big stage. Um, and one of the cool things about the book is that most of the art in the book is done by actual wrestlers. Uh, Jerry the King Lawler did the uh, covers, and he'll be uh, he'll be up here a little bit later on. And uh, the interiors of the book are done by a Samoan wrestler from New Zealand named Mikel Molapola. So uh, you know the book has a real authenticity to it. It uh, it feels uh, you know we try to do everything as uh, as real as possible, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. Mike, I got whatever I read your comic, I always think of it as sort of a almost like an HBO series, you know? Like, I like uh, th shows like The Wire and shows like Game of Thrones and things like that. Do you think that Headlock could trans translate into something like that? I do, because ultimately it's a coming-of-age story, you know? The things that, that Mike learns in the ring, like, are also lessons that sort of help him become a man. Um, you know, so when he starts out, he's just sort of young, suburban teenager. And, you know, a lot of things we talk about, a lot of movies, like, Characters don't really change a lot, especially in comics. You know, Peter Parker's been the same as issue one that he was, you know, issue 700. But, uh, you know, one of the cool things about, you know, telling the story is that he's totally undergoing a transformation. I mean, he's this, like I said, he's this, like, fresh-faced suburban kid, and he's going through the ringer. And, uh, you know, he'll come out a different person. It's certainly authentic. Is there anything you can tell us about, I mean... You're not a wrestler yourself, are you? Have you wrestled yourself? Are you always been a fan? How did you get this authentic feel? Did the wrestlers help you? Um, a little bit, yeah. I mean, I've done a lot of research. Um, obviously, a, an embarrassing amount of research. But, you know, some of that just comes from being a fan and, you know, enjoying the subject matter. Um, I'm, I know a lot of wrestlers, you know. I didn't when I started, but as uh, the book has gone on, the... Uh, you know, the amount of wrestlers that really like comics have been, you know, reached out and they'll, uh, you know, offered uh, suggestions and advice and whatnot. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a little of that, a little of, you know, a little of the research, but, uh, you know, and it's also the sort of passion I have for, uh, for wrestling as a fan, you know. I think that that's the one thing that sets Headlock apart from a lot of other things is that, uh, you know, I have a lot of passion for wrestling and all the wrestlers that, contribute to the book, have passion for comics and passion for art, and uh, it's a, uh, you know, I think that shows through in our product. Well, sitting right next to you is Samuel Shaw talking about passion for wrestling and passion, passion for art. Samuel, can you tell us about uh, how you got involved in this project? Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I was contacted, uh, actually, my friend, my good friend, Ken Anderson, <laughs> the man that called me the creepy bastard. That's where it all started, in London, England, that son of a... Uh, never mind. Uh, anyway, he, he contacted me and he said that, uh, you know, I had a, an art opportunity and I talked to this young man here and I wound up doing some artwork for him and he sent me the book, told me the story and I read the script and everything and it was really, really interesting. I'd never seen anything like that before. Like he was saying, growing up there was never really any wrestling comic books uh, except for like the WWF produced ones like I remember Jake the Snake versus Sid Justice and you know Sid Justice going after Jake the Snake because a snake attacked his family and whatnot but there was never anything like talking about you know how to get into the business and the struggles and all that kind of thing so this was really interesting to me so I was definitely uh, game for the project. How about your art history? Where did, where did you get your skills in art? Did you, are you self-trained or did you go to school? or what, where, where did this passion come from? 
I guess you could say initially self-trained. Uh, my mother tells me that when I was two or three years old, I'd watch you know superheroes and 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 wrestling on TV, and when the show was over, I'd be like, I want more of that, you know. So I'd take a piece of paper and crayons and be like, Hey, mom, draw me Superman, draw me Hulk Hogan, those kind of things, and. When I have to correct her as to, oh, you didn't do Superman's belt the right way, she's like, okay, well, you do it then. So it just became like, you know, I'm looking at all these little details, and she just felt like I was going to be something, you know, artistically driven in the future. So, uh, yeah, did I answer your question? No, sure. And natural, it sort of seems like a natural progression. But how did you enter into the wrestling world? Uh. Sort of just, you know, the same way with, with art, just, just watching these uh, superheroes on TV that, wait a minute, these guys are like real. This isn't like the cartoons, but these guys are actual tangible, you know, human beings, you know, at the time like superheroes, but you get a little bit older and you figure out that this could be a career. So this larger than life, real life superheroes, and that's just something that I had to be a part of. Well, one of the things that I love about Headlocked is it's so realistic. It gives you this really, really realism. And uh, I wondered, one of the things that you touched on in the last uh, graphic novel was injury. It's, you know, a lot of wrestlers get hurt. Uh, is this something that you fear as a wrestler, uh, or is it something that you uh, go into denial about? I try and put it out of my mind as much as possible, but I, I always, you know, the possibility is always there. Uh, I've been pretty lucky. I've... I'm coming up on 10 years uh, since I started, and I've had very, very, very minor issues. I had a, I've, I've been knocked out a few times. Um, definitely had my bell rung. Uh, no That's broken That's what you bones. get for talking back. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I busted my lip. I had to get 15 stitches all the way down my lip, knock my teeth out. But that's about the extent of, you know, that's, that's the worst injury that I had. That counts. I think getting your teeth knocked out counts. But uh, Mike, you know, if, if you want to tell the audience the structure of your story, you're following this guy, Mike Hoffman. He was, was, I take it as to be sort of your alter ego as he enters into the wrestling world. Um, but there's so many other people in, engaged in headlocks, and you have these special stories that the wrestlers do that, uh, you know, famous wrestlers have uh, hopped on the band, the headlock bandwagon. Could you tell us? You know who else has been involved in? Uh, yeah, like I said before, like a lot of the wrestlers that like comics um, have been really keen to be a part of it. Uh, you know, when I first started, it was just me in the book, you know, selling them out of Artist Alley. And uh, a few years ago at San Diego Comic Con, I, uh, Shane Helms came by and Rob Van Dam. They both bought copies of the book and then reached out to me later on to tell me how much they liked it and you know they wanted to be a part of it. And that's. Uh, it's been a lot of help because I mean we're obviously we're an independent um, you know it's not it's a non superhero non WWE type comic book so you know double independent in a lot of ways but uh, you know all these guys contributing have helped raise a lot of awareness for us which uh, has really been fantastic it's not really it's not easy to uh, to get to the to get anywhere in comics without the support of one of the top five publishers but uh, I think we've done pretty good at uh, you know, raising awareness and getting out into the world just with the help of uh, you know, some of my uh, talented, famous wrestling friends here that have been uh, super kind to contribute. Um, the, the first book we had, uh, you know, Jerry, Jerry Lawler does the covers, um, Rob Van Dam, Shane Helms, and Christopher Daniels wrote stories, and uh, my man here, Sh Sam, and uh, Ken Anderson and Sin Bodhi did pinups. And then for our upcoming book, uh, Booker T did art for it. Um, Tony Atlas and uh, Kalen Croft, who wrestled as one half of the Dude Busters, did uh, art. And John Morrison, AJ Styles, and Frankie Kazarian did stories for it. And uh, they're all very different stories. A lot of times they're not what you expect. Like everybody knows the Hurricane is a funny dude, but he did a real serious story. And you know, in the ring, AJ Styles is a very serious wrestler, but we did a really, really fun story that I think people are gonna like when it comes out. Um, and uh, they just add a little flavor, you know, Headlocked is the story of Mike Hartman, and they sort of tell stories about other wrestlers in the universe or other corners of the universe that, you know, later on we can steer Mike Hartman through as the uh, series progresses. You know, Mike, uh, you, 
you, you touched on the fact that you're an independent and, and you started off as sort of an outsider and you're a very humble man. So you're not telling us the grand successes that you've had with Headlock as far as your Kickstarter programs that you've done. It's amazing. Uh, how many people uh, backed uh, Mike on uh, Kickstarter? You guys know about it? No, not, not everybody here in the audience seems to know about it. I certainly backed it. But if you can join Mike on Kickstarter and, and you back him, it's like you pre-order the book and then you get it sent and you're helping out the publication of it. It's an amazing, amazing success story. Uh, you have, you've really broken down new doors with what you've been doing. Well, one of the things that, like I said, it's really hard to get on, get on uh, comic book store shelves as an independent. You know, a lot of times they just tend to order the, the big publishers and the, you know, or top 50 or whatever, you know, no matter who's attached to the book. So, you know, using Kickstarter, we were able to go out and appeal to, you know, maybe a different variety of fan, um, people who might be interested and, uh, you know, people were able to back it that way and we give people a better class of book, you know, the books that we sell, you know, or the headlock stories, but the stuff with all the wrestling content we, uh, we give to the people that, uh, that back us on Kickstarter and we're able to sell enough, pre you know, essentially pre-order enough books through Kickstarter to fund the production of the book. Like, I don't make a dime and I, I really don't care. I mean, it's like I said, it's a passion project and I want to be able to do it as long as I can. But, you know, all the artists get paid, my printer gets paid. Um, I have a printer that's very... He's been very good to me. He's out of Nashville. He probably costs a little bit more than a than an overseas printer, but uh, you know I feel like that's the right way to do business. So, you know we were able to we raised twenty seven thousand dollars for the first one and twenty two thousand dollars for the second one, and those uh, those helped us produce the books um, that we otherwise wouldn't have been able to do. You know if we had put them through comic book stores, you know I don't know if we'd have gotten the retail support to. Uh, to be able to sell enough to, to cover the production. So by doing it through Kickstarter, we were able to just go right to the masses and you know, say, is this something that you would be interested in? And luckily they were. So that, uh, that's been super beneficial for us. And, and being a backer of you on Kickstarter, the thing I like is I get updates from you and what's going on with Headlocked. And it comes to me in the email, and I know about the shows you're going to and where things are going to be and what's going on. So you can follow along with what the, what's going on in the wrestling world and what's going on at Headlocked just by joining this Kickstarter. If, if people were interested, how would, they, how would they do that? Well, we don't have a current Kickstarter running, but we'll probably be running another one in March. Um, but uh, one of the things that people seem to like is, you know, in a way that we rewarded people for helping out is by, uh, we draw people into the books. Um, and that's, Terry's actually drawn into the book as the announcer for the main wrestling company um, as part of his, as backer. We have people that have uh, been drawn in as wrestlers, um, people, people have been drawn in as champions, um, and it's a fun thing. We take your face, we put on a wrestler's body, you know, you get a pin-up from the artist drawn with, of your character, you know, it's kind of a, kind of a cool little wish fulfillment thing, um, and people like it, and I like it too, because I like for, you know, all the people that have helped out and helped us get to this point that I never thought we'd be at, honestly, you know, like you hope, you hope, but you sort of, you know, fight against the realities of the business, you never really think, it's going to get where it gets, but uh, it's, uh, you know, I like to, to reward those people too, so we like to do cool stuff for them. Well, it's not just cool, it's the quality, Mike, and you, you have a lot to be proud of. I'm, I'm dominating the microphone here, so if anybody has any questions, just raise your, your hands if you have some questions about wrestling or quest, questions about Headlocked. Uh, Mike, tell us about what, what life on the road for uh, Headlocked is like. How many, how many shows do you go to? Um, well, I have, a, I have a regular job, and I travel to as many shows as uh, I can get time off from work for and can afford to, you know, fly to. I work a night shift schedule, so for like this show, I got out of my job at 5.30 in the morning, drove to the airport, flew to Miami, took a cab to the show, set up, did the show for the, you know, for the whole time. When I leave the show, I will uh, go to the airport and probably drive right to my job, and you know that's how it goes. But you know, for me, like getting out in front of people and getting them to see what we're doing is, you know, is paramount. You know, during my Kickstarter campaigns, I I know there were four weekends in a row that I didn't see my house, but you know, it's something I believe in. And I think that people will like if they get a chance to give it a chance and uh, and to check it out. So, you know, I don't feel that like honestly like six hours with my in-laws at Christmas feels like a decade, but, you know, driving four hours to Tennessee to set up at a wrestling show, I don't feel that pain at all. So 
it's uh, you know it's a lot of time, but it's to me it's totally worth it. It's what I want to do, so it's cool. It's where the passion. If I can lies. add to that, yeah. I mean he's he's not just a fan anymore. He's actually living sort of what we have to go through. You know, it's it's a serious grind. Uh, I I'm still I still drive ten hours. I go to Texas. I go to Kentucky. You know, just to make few hundred bucks you know but it's something that I love to do Joe so. five hours to be here today thank you Sam <laughs> does this does this put a pressure on your personal life uh, th these passions that you have obviously you're driven men and you're you're passionate about what you do uh, does this put a, does it put pressure on you obviously I think it would it's weird it 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 did at first when I was just starting out, I think uh, my wife was a lot less cool about it than she is now because she's seen what it's become. And, you know, I think it looks like such an insurmountable thing when you start, like, you know, you got to do all these things, you know, you're going to go and buy a table and sit there in the back of the room, you know, with a bunch of other people and hopefully somebody notices you and you're going to sell enough books to cover your table and to cover your trans or whatever, you know. And you don't make money right away. I mean, I did a show in Toronto. My first two shows, I did Philly and Chicago, and they were great. And then I did a show in Toronto, the Fan Expo. And I thought to myself, well, it's a bigger show. I'll sell more books. It'll be great. And I was in the back in Artist Alley, and I was between... They have a horror section there, and I was between the horror section. I was between Satanic Priests and a carnival, like a freak show carnival, and there was a dude outside trying to get people in, and he was badgering them, so everybody was just going around our table. And I didn't sell anything. I mean, I sold some things, but not a whole lot. And then I, uh, I got sick at the restaurant, and I left my bag there, and my cash box got stolen. And then as I was leaving, I had my books on a hand cart, and I was going up an escalator, and the box broke open, and my books went down the escalator that was packed full of people, and it was horrible. It was like the worst thing. It was such an, or an awful ordeal, and I didn't go back to Toronto for five years. Um, I just went back to Toronto this past uh, September and had a really great show, so I feel like that demon has now been exercised, but, you know, when you start, it's just, it's tough just to get people to pay attention and to stop. I mean, when you walk through there, there's so many bright colors and there's so many things and there's so many things to do and celebrities to meet, like, you know, you think to yourself, you know, some random dude in the back, you know, who's going to stop and notice you. So I think there was some trepidation on the part of my wife to bring it back to what it was, but... She's, she's a lot more on board now, you know, she's got to see some of the successes I've had and I've, I've done a lot of really cool things for a guy with an independent comic. Like I, I, I once got into a party that Joss Whedon couldn't get into, so I think that's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, so it, it does put a little bit of a strain, but she's, she's on board, so. For sure, for sure. I just always think about the fact, uh, one of the most daunting things about this business, uh, the professional wrestling business, is think about this, there's what, and I'm not really a big sports guy anymore, but the NFL, there's how many teams? 32. 32 teams, and how many you know, players are out there trying to get a job with one of those 32 teams? But look at professional wrestling, there's what? Two places to go? You know, there's more now, but if you really want to make money, there's really one place to go, you know? And, I mean, to me, that's, like, the most daunting thing. To, to be in this line of work and to really succeed, it takes, you know, and I'm not saying I'm special, but, you know, I, I feel like I'm just scratching the surface now. And, like I said, I'm 10 years in, and I, I feel like I have a lot left to prove and a lot left to do. Um, but it seems very daunting to me sometimes when I wake up I'm just like what am I doing I'm 31 years old now I started when I was you know 22 23 years old and I could have told you when I when I started like oh I'll, I'll be in WWE in two years you know and I'm so thankful that I didn't have an opportunity when I was two years into the business because it was I was not ready, let me tell you. And I feel like, like I said, 10 years in now, I feel like I'm just now starting to get really good. So, 
Samuel, can you give us a high point, some of, some of the high points that, you know, right now that you'd say, man, this makes it all worthwhile? I'm going to ask Mike the same thing because I know as a fan, some great things have happened to him that have just been mind-blowing. How about for you? Uh, I mentioned this at the beginning. Uh, my good buddy Ken Anderson, when he called me the creepy bastard <laughs> in London, England, you would think that would hurt my feelings, but... When I had the whole crowd in Wembley Arena chanting creepy bastard at me and it gave me goosebumps. It's just like, wow. It, it doesn't matter what they're saying, you, you're getting the reaction that you want. When the crowd is into what you're doing, that's just like the best feeling ever, you know? Oh yeah, the, the adrenaline and everything. Mike, what about you? Some high points that I know that some, some of your greatest idols have come in and given you great positive feedback on your book and stuff. Well, I think it's really cool just, I mean, to have all these guys involved, you know, that I grew up watching and to have them all be so amazing. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I used to trade for Memphis tapes because we didn't, I'm from upstate New York. And, you know, so I was always a big fan of Jerry Lawler. And then to have him work on my books now and to be able to call him a friend, I think is, is insane to me. And, you know, they always tell you like not to meet your heroes, but I've met a good number of my heroes and they've all been really fantastic you know you, you see people on TV and you think you have an idea of who they are but you know just so many of them are so nice and so generous and we're some of the nicest people in the world they really are it's no joke I mean humble too you know I've <laughs> I've I mean I've had one foot in comics and I've had one foot in wrestling and I've been treated a million times better by the people in the wrestling industry than by people in the comic book industry like and, you know, you hear all these horrible stories about, you know, oh, it's so, you know, shady and whatever, but everybody's awesome. They've been so great. And I don't, I don't know if I've ever really had a bad experience. I mean, I guess Virgil, Virgil caught me out of an autograph at my first comic book show, but whatever. <laughs> what about, um, I remember uh, something happened to you in San Diego, um, and uh, um, I think it was a total surprise. I think it was... Uh, the guy from They Live, the movie They Live, uh, Rowdy Roddy Piper came by. And oh, was, yeah. Yeah, no, he was, I mean, he came by. He was really, uh, he was really cool and supportive about the book. Um, you know, I just, got a, I just got a message from uh, Dr. Tom Pritchard, and I don't, you might remember him as one half of the Heavenly Bodies, but he's one of the best, like, sort of well-regarded trainers in the business, and he wrote me a, an email to tell me how much he liked the book, which my book is about a kid breaking into the wrestling business, so... You know, to get a, get praise from a from a guy with that sort of credential is is really very gratifying. Um, and yeah, all, I mean, pretty much all the wrestlers that have have read it have been really really positive and complimentary about it. So uh, that's been really it's been really cool. Well, you know, I I'm looking for questions out there. If there isn't any questions, one of the things that's been driving me crazy and what I want to know. Have you met with Hollywood people who want to make your, your, your book into a movie or a series? Or have you, have you had these uh, meetings? I mean, I've talked to some people, and people come by at San Diego and look. But, I mean, it's Hollywood. They blow smoke. I mean, I think it would be a cool story. I think a, a coming-of-age wrestling story is a, is a cool way to do it, and it's a cool way to look at the, the sort of the art form of wrestling, which is why I wrote the book in the first place. But... Uh, I think uh, I think it would make a nice translation. I'd like to see it. Uh, I'd really like to see it as a, like a late night cartoon, so nobody really has to bump for it. Um, I think that would be pretty cool. Um, and uh, I'd like to get some of my uh, some of my wrestling friends to do voice work for it because I think that would be uh, that would be really neat. We actually have a, a motion comic up on YouTube that uh, Ken Anderson did one of the voices for. Um, it's called Headlock the Face. Um, it's a little short story. And uh, it gives you an, a little bit of an idea what the series is about, and I think it's kind of fun. And I'd like to do something like that. So uh, we, uh, we have another special guest here who's uh, a part of Headlocked, and uh, he's the cover artist, and he's making his way from the back here. I see his glittery shirt from here. I believe that's uh, Jerry the King Lawler, folks. Mike, this is truly an exciting time in Headlock. Uh, 
uh, for Headlocked. What is, what is the next, uh, when is the next volume coming out and in the printing? Uh, we should have it done by the uh, beginning of October, just in time for New York Comic Con. Um, I'm really excited about it. It's a fun, it's a really fun, it's not a fun story, it's a fun story to write. Yeah, look at his face, you can tell how excited he is. This, <laughs> but, on all honesty, that's his excited face, or his mad face, or his upset face. <laughs> this guy never changes his facial expression. <laughs> tell us again how excited you are. I'm pretty excited. It's a little dark. But uh, that's sort of part of the business. You know, it's a roller coaster. You know, you, like, like Sam was talking, you come in with all the optimism in the world and then sort of the realities of things sort of beat you down and then you have to fight through that. And he's going through that kind of a patch right now where it's pretty rough and, uh, you know, hopefully he'll come out on the other side. I would assume he will because I want to keep writing it, so. Jerry, we touched on earlier about being an artist and being a wrestler. I'm, I'm speaking from you way out here. Oh, okay. And of course, a, a lot of people, believe it or not, don't know what, a, what an accomplished artist you are. Can you tell us a little bit about your art history and take us through what, what, what got you into art and, and wrestling? Because that's such a great story. Oh, goodness. It is a great story? Absolutely. I love the, the news and how you wrote, you know, how you wrote the, you drew it's the news. It's pretty good. Uh, not, well, maybe not as good as Headlocked? Well, you know what? I mean, it's, I, I guess the problem that I have with it, um, not really a problem, but I, I, I've always taken my artistic ability sort of for granted I was because it always came so easy I remember when I was five years old I just you know started drawing and uh, mainly Superman Batman superheroes and that sort of thing and continued on my entire life you know drawing all through school when I probably should have been doing homework I'm still drawing all the time um, and so it always amazed me that everybody couldn't draw because it just seemed like it just was something that just came so natural uh, and then when I um, uh, got into high school, uh, I guess the w one thing I can really thank my artistic ability for was uh, it was like 1967 when I graduated. It was right at the height of the Vietnam War, and all my buddies were getting, um, uh, you know, if you didn't have a college deferment, you were getting shipped off to Vietnam and wound up right on the front lines fighting and everything. So uh, uh, I, I fully intended to, that's, that's where I was going to, be going because my family didn't have enough money or to send me at the time to, to college so I was all ready to get drafted and go to go to war uh, and unbeknownst to me my high school art teacher a great little lady named Helen Stahl who is still alive to this day and has an interview on my new DVD that just came out a couple of weeks ago uh, she had put together a portfolio of my artwork and she submitted it to the University of Memphis and I won a full tuition commercial art scholarship so I got to go to college instead of going to Vietnam at the time, and uh, uh, it, which was a, a good thing for me. And so, uh, that, like I said, you know, that was one, one thing that really came out good for me f uh, because of my artistic ability. But then the second thing, not long after I'd got started in college, um, on a whim, some, somebody said, hey, you ought to send some of those uh, caricatures that you're doing of the uh, the wrestlers. I was, I was also going to the wrestling matches locally there in Memphis. They'd have matches every Monday night uh, down at the Ellis Auditorium. And my dad and I would go down to the matches. Somebody said, hey, you ought to send some of those drawings that you're doing of the wrestlers into the TV station. So I put together four or five pictures, sent them into the TV station. I don't even know what I was thinking, why, why I was doing it. But uh, the following Saturday, I, I turn on the TV on Saturday morning and our Two local announcers, Lance Russell and Dave Brown, are sitting there at the desk just like this, and they're talking about, well, welcome to another big Saturday morning of uh, championship wrestling. And as I'm looking at them talking there, I look over in the corner of the desk, and my pictures were laying there on the desk. And I thought, oh, my gosh, there's, he's going to show my artwork there. And sure enough, about halfway through the show, he said, let's take a look at what went on down at the uh, auditorium last Monday night. And we have some pictures here sent in by... A uh, young man named Jerry Lawler, and uh, we're going to kind of illustrate with these pictures what, what took place at the matches. So they showed my artwork, and I was all proud and excited. And when the show was over, I got a phone call, and it was Lance Russell, the announcer, and he said, hey, everybody liked your artwork, and we were wondering if you could do some more next week. So I subsequently became like a sort of like, you know how you see a courtroom reporter, you know, they won't let a photographer in the courtroom. Well, it was the same way. I became like a ringside artist for... Uh, uh, the, the Monday night wrestling in Memphis. I would go down and, and do kind of sketches of what took place at the matches and then instead of the guys just being talking heads talking about what took place, they work and kind of illustrate it. 
And that's how I got my foot in the door, met Jackie Fargo, who was like the top wrestler at the time in Memphis, and he liked my art, and uh, even went so far as to start up a, a sign company with his name on it. Of course, I was doing all the art and all the lettering and that sort of stuff with the, with the sign company. But anyway, we became good friends, and I, I got to travel with him and see the lifestyle of the wrestling, and I just fell in love with it. Then I started badgering him about maybe letting me actually try to have a match. And he said, no, kid, you're too good an artist. You, you, you just need to stick with art because, believe me, you don't want to get in this crazy business. You stick with art and you'll be a, a famous artist someday. And I just kept on and said, look, if I promise you, Jackie, if I could just have one match, if I could just try it one time, I promise you I'll go back to being an artist and you'll never hear from me again. I'll just do artwork. Finally, I talked him into letting me have that one match and that was... 44 years ago, and here I am still doing the uh, wrestling thing. And But this book and, and things like this have given me an opportunity to kind of come full circle and go back to doing more of the artwork that I promised Jackie Fargo 44 years ago that I would stick with. So um, that's why I'm excited to be a part of this, this Headlocked comic book series. And it gives me an opportunity to not only um, do more artwork, but it gives me an opportunity to do artwork that's related to wrestling, which is kind of a combination of uh, everything I've been involved with my entire life. There was the boring story, folks. That's it. And if you see it, uh, if you come over to our table, we have a, you know, one of the covers that Jerry did for the book was a, uh, like a Norman Rockwell tribute, and uh, it's pretty amazing. You know, one of the things I like, do you know the book being about sort of the art of wrestling is to have like a, a cool fine art cover, and he totally knocked it out of the park. It's definitely worth uh, coming over to take a gander at. Everything at your booth is worth taking a gander at. It's a fantastic, <laughs> fantastic book, fantastic product. Anybody have any other questions? I do not want to mo monopolize you here. Mike, you, oh, we got a question right here, okay. Hi, I was curious, do you have an ending already to the, the progress of the wrestler and you're just kind of filling in or is it kind of something that you're doing organically when you're writing? totally letting the characters write themselves. I mean, I wait until the Kickstarters are done, until I see, like, the people send in their pictures for the likeness rewards and stuff, and then I try to match them up with, like, I try to figure out what kind of a character they would be. Like, for my last book that I did, the volume one, the entire third issue, I had no idea I was writing that when I started writing it. And then one of the guys, like, his likeness, you know, I thought, well, he would make a great hardcore wrestler, and then it totally took the story in a whole different direction. And I think the story is better for it that way. Um, you know, at, sort of my understanding of things evolves too. Is that, you know, I mean, when I started writing the book, I just think you know my understanding of wrestling has evolved too. You know, as I learn more about it, you just, you know, it helps uh, the story becomes better. So I, I don't really know how it's going to end, honestly. I want to write it as long as I can write it. Um, there's so much, there's such a rich culture. Uh, I mean, I could take them to Japan, I could take them to England. I mean, wrestling's different all over the world. Um, it's treated by fans differently all over the world. Um, there's just a lot of fantastic stories to tell. So uh, I just want to do it as long as I can. Mike, you sort of touched on something. I, I, I read a lot about writing and writers and what they say, and you, you mentioned that the, the characters almost wrote themselves. What is that like? Is that like, a, like you're almost, uh, your brain, goes into, into hibernation and you start writing? What, what, what's going on? Well, I mean, I know what I want to get out of every issue. Um, you know, the, the way it's sort of structured, I guess if I had a formula, is the main character learns sort of one thing about wrestling. Like he learns how to run the ropes or maybe learns how to bump or whatever. And then that one thing relates to, you know, his sort of journey to become a man as well. And so we do like one thing, an issue, and then it sort of relates to what's going on in his life, um, almost like an episodic TV show. So I know what I want to get out of the issue, and you know, then I figure out how I want to get there. But sometimes, you know, like if your character isn't going to act that way, you can't, you know, you can't twist your characters to fit the story. You have to find a way to tell the story within the parameters of the characters that you built. One of the things that I really liked was the. Uh, the, when the character had to wear a mask and he was going through a lot of wrestling uh, learning about wrestling and he was wearing a mask and it almost you know I'm a superhero fan you know and it almost brought back memories to me of Spider-Man when he first started out and everything like that and I wondered uh, you know we've got Samuel and, and Jerry up there did you guys ever uh, wrestle wearing masks? 
No, I have not, but I'm not against it. <laughs> Stay tuned. Well, I certainly have. As a matter of fact, uh, I probably wouldn't be sitting here and wouldn't even be in the wrestling business had I not been such a fan of masked wrestlers. I mean, when I was, when I was going to the shows, I, I, I couldn't get enough of them. There was a team that uh, I just really fell in love with in Memphis called the Blue Infernos. And, and our, our Memphis promotion at the time in the, in the mid-60s was, it was kind of a low-budget type operation. And the promoter there, Nick Goulas, would bring in, um, uh, he would bring a, a lot of wrestlers from Mexico who were just, I mean, basically for the simple fact that they, they, were, they were talented, but they would work cheap. And, and so he would recycle these guys. You know, he would bring them in as uh, whoever they, their, their real name and what they really looked like. And then after they'd been there for six or eight weeks, he'd repackage them and put a mask on them. And, and uh, then once that guy had been wrestling with a mask on for six or eight weeks, he'd repackage him again and put a different color mask and a different, uh, different outfit. And so, um, you know, we had, we had a lot of masked wrestlers in our, in our territory down there for me to watch. But the Blue Infernos, uh, were two guys that um, uh, I just I just really I don't know are there any really hardcore old school wrestling fans around in here today no uh, one of the, one of the wrestlers was a guy named Gypsy Joe who is still alive today and and he would go to uh, later on after he took the mask off and he was famous for going over to to Japan a lot and wrestling over there and just do you remember him in, ever heard the name Gypsy Joe I mean he would just he was a obviously a masochist he would just let uh, the other wrestlers beat him. Uh, he reminded me of like Mick Foley reminded me of of him. He would just let guys just beat him senseless, and he and he loved it. I mean, you could hammer him over the head with chairs, tables, anything. But um, but anyway, when I first started wrestling, um, as a matter of fact, when I when I went to um, when I was going to University of Memphis in college. They, we, we didn't even have enough uh, guys go out for a wrestling team to field a team, and the baseball coach kind of, kind of uh, substituted as a wrestling coach. There were five guys that even went out to take the wrestling course, and the first day I showed up in a destroyer mask uh, that I had ordered out of the back of a magazine, wrestling magazine, the white mask with a black stripe down the thing, and so uh, needless to say, the collegiate wrestling coach didn't find the humor in that. So I, I was out the door after, on the first day uh, but I always wanted to wrestle with, with a mask. I always wanted to be a masked wrestler from the time I started. And it wasn't until 1976 that I um, uh, left the Memphis Territory and went down to wrestle for Eddie Graham down in, down in Florida. And uh, I went down there with a guy named, a wrestler named Don Green. And we went as the Heavenly Bodies and, and wore, wore masked outfits. And we wrestled down there for about six months with the mask on. And I loved it. I loved every minute of it. Question. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for the King. Um, but when I grew up, I remember you more for announcing with JR. I always felt that you were like the, the John Mann to like his Pat Summerall. How, how was that working with JR in, in the WWE as an announcer? Like, uh, how was that part of the King's character? Well, when I grow up, I want to work with JR too <laughs> someday again. Um, <laughs> JR was always so easy to work with, really, uh, in the fact that he was, I mean, you know, he was the consummate professional as far as being prepared for everything. JR knew all the statistics. He knew all the names of all the holds. He knew every wrestler's background and, and everything about him. And so all I had to do was just show up and react to, to what I saw, which I always thought was what a kind of color commentator should do anyway. But, uh, you know, I mean, it was, it was so easy working with him because he just he would just uh, I don't know you, you were never you were never caught off guard by anything you were just uh, as I said he was always so prepared for anything I mean I, I wouldn't even uh, I don't know I mean I wouldn't even have to go to the production meetings or and I told I would tell everybody you know I don't want to have any clue about what's going on uh, I don't want to know what's what I'm going to see next. I want to react just like I would, you know, just like a fan would. And and Jr. was always cool with that. Now, of course, Jr. went to production meetings, and he would. So, so that was why it was so easy working with him. I mean, he always knew, you know, exactly what was going on, and I could just kind of show up at the last minute and um, en enjoy the show. I always I always looked at my job as being when I was working with Jr. It was like the easiest job and the best job in the company because I had 
the best seat in the house to watch matches, and I was still a fan, and, and I always looked at it as like, hey, I'm, I'm sitting in my den with my good pal, my next door neighbor here, and I'm talking about what I'm watching on, on the screen. And so that, that uh, always worked for JR, and it always worked for me as well. So he was, he was always the best to work with. Question? Yeah, this is for the King. Um, you and JR called Survivor Series 97 together, and I've heard conflicting reports about the screw job. Did both of you or neither of you know what was going to go down at the end of that match there? Well, I can tell you honestly that I had no idea what was going to go down at the end of that match. Um, and I, on, I honestly don't think, uh, I don't think JR did either. If, if, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, that was doing the commentary on that. Vince was a part of the commentary team as well, wasn't he? Oh, no, you're right. He came out, rang the bell, and then I, all I can – the reason I guess I get confused about Vince being a part of the match is I was standing this, this close to Vince when Brett spit in his, Vince's eye, and I just remember looking over and looking up at Brett, and I was thinking, uh oh, this is <laughs> – I don't think Vince would have wanted that to happen. So, uh, that, I mean, that was part of the deal that I, that I you know, made me convinced that, uh, that it was all – you know, for real, that nobody knew that what was going to happen. And so um, um, I honestly have, you know, since that time, I've wondered if uh, more people were in on it than, than, you know, was generally perceived. But to this day, um, I don't think anybody's talking. Nobody, nobody really knows exactly what happened. Question. Uh, this is for all three of you guys. I just wanted to get your guys' perspective. Um, there, there seems to be a drop in ratings uh, recently for the WWE because of the PG era. I just wanted to know if you guys think that it should be like Attitude Era 2.0 if that ever happens again. Like you think it should be more racy, more hardcore and stuff like that. I personally don't think that I don't know. I don't think it's necessarily attributable to the, the PG era per se. I think there's just a lot more stuff. I mean, in the last 15 years or so, I mean, TV's gotten really good. I mean, you got Breaking Bad, Game of Thrones, all that type of stuff. I mean, back back in the 90s, I mean, it was just, it was WWE, Friends, South Park. I mean, there wasn't a whole lot going on, but I mean, TV's gotten really good. There's just a lot more competition. People have a lot more options. And, uh, you know, I don't think it's necessarily a a lessening of an interest because I mean everybody still seems to know what's going on whenever you talk to them even if they claim they don't watch it on you know regularly I think people are uh, I think people are still interested people follow the product some people follow it on the internet watch it you know watch it online I think uh, I don't necessarily think it's a it's a it's an entirely fair gauge of uh, you know the popularity of it especially now I mean there's so many options I mean Lucha Underground is doing great and then Wednesday nights there's a whole block of different stuff so I just think there's a, there's a lot of options for people, but I don't think wrestling is any less popular. I think uh, I, I'm still a fan deep down, and I think that we are on the cusp, if not in sort of a boom period right now uh, as we speak. I think it's like, look at Wednesday nights. Like, well, first of all, we have Monday night, as always, but then Wednesday night, like we have what four different you know wrestling programs on, and it's it's like it's like I'm a little kid again because I can I can study so many different you know types of wrestling uh, that can appeal to you know all types of uh, the audience. Um, Attitude era stuff, like look at Lucha Underground. It's it's amazing. Like some of the stuff, the backstage stuff they do. It's filmed like a movie and. Robert Rodriguez is executive producer on that. He's, you know, he did what Desperado and uh, Machete, Machete. Machete, Dust of Dawn. I, you have that. You have, you know, Ring of Honor, WWE, TNA, all these different companies doing something a little bit different. And I think within the next year, I think it's just going to explode even more. So I'm excited about it. Just like I was about the, you know, the attitude era that you speak of. Yeah, uh, you know, from my point of view, there's no doubt that the attitude era was more fun um, to be a part of. 
than it is now. Um, but it's just, unfortunately, it's a fact of life. I think what the difference is, once the WWE became a publicly traded company, went to having a board of directors, uh, you know, having to worry so much about what your uh, corporate sponsors thought of your product, what the public thought of your product with social media now, everybody has a voice to tell you what they think of your product. And we just, um, it's not just the WWE, but everybody, it just has to be so politically correct these days. You know, and not, not, in my opinion, not that that's a good thing. I was watching Jerry Seinfeld the other day and he was saying, I don't even do college, I don't even play college campuses anymore because you know, they, they expect you to be so politically correct that he can't even do his, you know, he can't even do half of the comedy routines that, and, and Jerry Seinfeld certainly is not a, you know, I mean, he's not a, uh, a dirty comedian or anything like that, but he's just saying that the world now and, and people expect you to be so politically correct that it's just not fun to uh, perform anymore. But that's, that's the world we live in now. I mean, you, you realize, uh, I mean, I, I, especially on Twitter, you know, I, in the attitude era, oh my gosh, the things that we used to get away with saying about, you know, me talking about the divas and puppies and all of that sort of stuff. <laughs> my God. I mean, nowadays, you can't even, um, you can't even say that a, that a diva is even, they don't even want you to say that they're sexy anymore. You know, divas almost have to be treated exactly like the male wrestlers and only talk about their wrestling ability and their in-ring ability and 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 just because the public is so uh, so conscious and so touchy about uh, certain things and 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 as I said now with all the social media everybody has a voice and they you know and there's almost anything you do is going to offend somebody and they just the companies now uh, when when you're publicly traded you try to avoid offending anybody question yes i have a message a uh, question for the king first thank you you're like my first here i'm from louisville so any first i want your favorite matches in the louisville gardens and oh. any good stories about lance russell oh my gosh well lance russell uh for those that don't know is the announcer that i was talking about that uh, helped me get my foot in the door in wrestling to begin with and he was a legendary announcer on memphis wrestling for over 40 years and uh, Lance still going strong today it was just I was just at a Memphis Comic Expo a couple of weeks ago and Lance would made an appearance there he's retired lives down in uh, near Pensacola Florida now but he's uh, still great his voice is still booming out there and he's just a, a fun guy to be around and and, um, and Louisville Kentucky we used to do every, every shows every Tuesday night at Louisville Gardens and my probably one of my favorite memories uh, other than the fact of of seeing a young Jimmy Cornette at being like 12 or 13 years old, seeing, watch him grow up running around the ring there in, in Louisville, which was his hometown. And he started out as a, a photographer uh, doing, doing uh, pictures of the matches and sending them into the magazines and taking the guys' uh, uh, sort of publicity photos on a weekly basis that they could turn around and sell to the public. Um, All these years later, he still has that 12-year-old face too. Yeah, no kidding. Then. Um, but one of my one of my all-time favorite stories out of Louisville was uh, the fact that we promoted a um, a scaffold match. The scaffold matches were kind of invented down in Tennessee. As you know, when we ran shows on a weekly basis down there, every week you had to try to come up with something to top the last week, and the matches had to be bigger, better, more dangerous, or more exciting. So Jerry Jarrett, who was my partner in the business, came up with the idea of building. Uh, uh, putting two like 15 foot ladders on either side of the on either end of the ring and then putting a scaffold across the tops of those ladders and letting the wrestlers go up and wrestle each other on those scaffold and the only way you would lose is to get thrown off drop 15 feet into the ring right so eh, it's a, that sounds good and exciting as long as you're not having to participate in one of them but um, we we had this uh, we were having this uh, feud going by myself and Austin Idol and Tommy Rich and Paul Heyman was their manager. And so at his, Paul Dangerously is what he was going as at the time. So we built up this match to where we forced Paul Heyman into the scaffold match. And everybody wanted to see Paul Heyman had to climb up that scaffold and get thrown off and break his neck, you know, when he landed on the bottom. So we built this thing up for like a month. 
we get to Louisville Gardens on the final Tuesday night and Paul Heyman had been making these interviews, telling everybody about how scared he was, but when, they, when he finally gets up on the top of that scaffold, what he was gonna do to me and how he's gonna throw me off and break my neck and all this sort of thing. So anyway, we get there, we have a complete sellout. We get ready to go out for the match and Paul Heyman says, I can't, I can't go up on the scaffold. And I said, what do you mean you can't go up on the scaffold? He said, no, I really can't. I'm a, I really have a fear of heights. And I said, Paul, we had like 5,200 people out there in Louisville Gardens. And I said, they've all come to see you up on that scaffold night. He said, well, I can't go. So anyway, we went, we've wound up having some words. And I don't remember exactly how the story goes, other than Paul wound up getting punched in the jaw and wound up with a broken jaw some kind of way. And he's still to this day where there's a little bit of hard feelings between Paul Heyman and I. Uh, but that was uh, one of the most memorable things. And he didn't go up on the scaffold. But we did at least we were able to tell the people that he had a, suffered a broken jaw before the match, and so they were a little bit happy. Uh, <laughs> but that's the, one of my big memories of that. Other than the fact that uh, uh, there was a big fight one night in the dressing room between, between um, Lanny Poffo and Rip Rogers. And <laughs> I had just... <laughs> I've been involved in a lot of, or not involved, but I've seen a lot of fights. One was between Bret Hart and, and Shawn Michaels in the, in the locker room. And um, this one was between Rip Rogers and Lanny Poffo in the locker room. And every time, for some reason, I'd be in my dressing room, I would be naked. And so anyway, I just remember in the Louisville Gardens, I'm, I'm, I don't know, shaving or something. I just got out of the shower, and I'm drying off, and I'm standing there naked. And all of a sudden, boom, my door breaks open, and here these two guys come in fighting on, fighting on the floor. And Randy Savage is coming in trying to pull them apart, and I'm standing there with no clothes on trying to help pull these guys apart. But anyway, Louisville Gardens was a great, was a great uh, place. We had some wonderful matches there in Louisville. Well, thank you for that visual image. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> One thing the King touched on, Mike, was uh, social media, and you're, you've been a master with headlocks on social media. Could you tell people how you, you know, how they can get in touch with you and give you uh, sexy comments? Yes, I welcome all sexy comments. <laughs> um, everything associated with the book is all headlocked comic. It's one word. It's Facebook. It's Twitter. It's our website. You can get books off our website. Um, it's my Xbox gamer tag. If anybody wants to play, um, but uh, yeah, I try to keep it all the same. Our Instagram. I eat a lot of food, so I have a lot of, some people follow me on Instagram because they like the food that I eat, so. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. This is for all of you. I actually have two questions. One was, you know, it, we know that the wrestling is choreographed, and how much of the match is choreographed? Do, yes. you, do you choreograph the entire match? Do you have basic ideas of what you're going to do and then kind of wing some of it from there? And then my second question was, how did you feel about a fan being inducted into the Hall of Fame, Connor? What, what was the second question about the Hall of Fame? How did you feel about a fan being inducted in the Hall of Fame, Connor? Oh, oh, oh. oh I, I mean... It, to me, Connor being inducted was, I mean, that was awesome. I mean, you know, that was, uh, um, he, had been, he had been featured a, a lot on, our, on the WWE programming and had, you know, been in the hearts of all of the fans at that time. And so, you know, we have the celebrity wing, supposedly, um, in, in, the, in the WWE Hall of Fame. So, yeah, I thought, I thought that was great and, and possibly, you know, an, an opened the door for um, other inductions like that. I mean, it doesn't have to be just all uh, WWE superstars. As, as we've shown, you know, we can induct different celebrities. I'm, I've been plugging away for years to try to get Andy Kaufman uh, inducted into the <laughs> WWE Hall of Fame. But yeah, no, I, th I thought it was great to ha have Connor in there. As far as your first part of your question, Mike, you want to answer that? Or do you want to answer that? <laughs> um. As far as choreographing a whole match, I, I think personally for me, uh, sort of the art of pro wrestling is, okay, you can have some stuff choreographed, but can you go out there and react to, to how this crowd is, is sort of treating this, this, this spectacle that they have in front of them? Um, could, you, could you throw an audible in there if you needed to? and react the way 
that uh, needed needed to happen in order for this match to to work. Um, it, it doesn't always go like, for instance, if somebody gets knocked out, like then what? Your plans are out the window, you know. So um, just just being able to uh, react and be smart about the business that you have at hand, I, I think there's a there's a real art to that. I'm I'm sure. Mr. Lawler here could attest to that. Well, that's probably the, um, you know, the biggest change in our business that I've seen over the years uh, is the amount of choreography that goes into matches. And, and I think you know, this has come about in the, uh, with the advent of um, you know, more writers being involved and more people wanting to see their, have their input in what happens in matches and that sort of thing. I mean, I you know when I when I start when I started in the business, uh, as you said, that was part of the fun and part of the excitement of of performing was going out and and um, responding, literally responding uh, to the crowd. Uh, you know, uh, we gosh, probably ninety percent of the time when I first started in the business and through for years and years, I mean, you would you would get to a show and the good guys and the bad guys would dress in different places and come out of different entrances and ne really never even see each other or talk to each other before the match until you got into until you got into the ring with each other and and to me that was a you know that was a fun time when you just it was literally a improv situation when you went into the ring um, and quite frankly that's not the case anymore uh, more and more of it is you know uh, not left to chance and to me that when you take that element of chance out of there it's kind of it's not as much um not as much fun as it used to be got a question hi for the two gentlemen over on the left um i'm curious as to where you draw your identity from where would you say that you are wrestlers who are artistic or would you say that you are artists who happen to wrestle that's interesting question. Um, honestly, I, I don't really think that there's much of a difference. Uh, I, th I think that, you know, like, like Mr. Lawler here, he started drawing when he was five years old. I started drawing when I was, you know, roughly around that age as well. Uh, I, I think of it almost like pro wrestling is, is like you have a blank canvas and literally the ring is your canvas and you're, you're out there painting a picture just like I would on a piece of paper with a pencil, you know? So I'm telling a story with a pencil on paper. I'm telling a story in the ring. Uh, hope that answers your question. I, I just think that they're one and the same. It's artistic. That's why I love them both. And I think I know a bunch of wrestlers, and I think that's one of the sort of themes of my book is it's just sort of the, the sort of artistic soul of the business. But I mean, just in talking to people, like if you have a conversation with them, like they know how to tell stories. Like you don't generally hear super boring stories from, from wrestlers because they kind of know how to build and, you know, tell the story and make it interesting. And I think that's just, again, it just blurs the line. I think, you know, I think it is an art form, and I think that, you know, there isn't that much of a distinction. Question. All right. Now, the thing is, I just got back into watching wrestling after a pretty decent hiatus. But of all your many years in the wrestling industry, what do you think would have been your most memorable celebrity appearance? I think he's talking to you. I don't to know all years. three of them. To all three of you, including you, Mr. Lawler. First of all, you said you just got back from watching what? From a hiatus from wrestling for a oh, while. Oh, you haven't been watching wrestling for a while. Yeah. And you're asking what was our most... Yeah, like the most memorable celebrity appearance, most memorable guest <laughs> in any of your shows. Oh, in any of the, like the WWE shows when we had different yeah. guest hosts and all of yeah, those things? Yeah, exactly. On what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, man. Um, gosh, there were literally have been, there have been, you know, so many different guests and everything. Um, and, and I'd really like to thank, I, I'd like to thank Andy Kaufman for opening that door. Uh, because the 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 only reason I got introduced to Andy Kaufman was because he went to Vince McMahon Sr. first and said, Mr. McMahon, I'm Andy Kaufman, and I would like to 
come to one of your shows and wrestle some women on, on your uh, event. I want to wrestle in front of a wrestling crowd, in front of people that came to see wrestling. And at the time, Vince Sr. turned him down and he said, Andy, he said, I just, you know, I don't want to involve Hollywood actors with our wrestling because our fans are skeptical enough and I'm just afraid that they might think that, you know, all our wrestlers are actors. And uh, then later on when they saw how well the reception was to Andy being involved in wrestling when he came down to Memphis and made headlines with, uh, you know, him getting hospitalized in the, with the pile driver and then we went on the David Letterman show and, uh, you know, I, I later on, just not that long ago, as a matter of fact, I was sitting with Vince and he said, uh, he told me, he said, I can't tell you how jealous I was of you guys getting Andy Kaufman down there when I know that my dad had the opportunity to get him first. And he said, not, trust me, not that I think that we could have done anywhere near what you guys did with him. I mean, it was perfect, but, uh, you know, it, was just, it, really, it really made him jealous of the fact that they didn't, you know, take advantage of that. And then all of a sudden, once that, once that hit, they opened the door, you know, started with Cindy Lauper, then Mr. T, and then from, you know, one Hollywood star to another. I mean, it's been an endless, it's been an endless um, open door here in the WWE, and, and, and I can just think of, I, I know when, you know, when I first got there, I got to have the King's Court. I remember having Tiny Tim as a guest on the King's Court and smashing his, his little ukulele. And, yeah, I don't think it was good um, for him. And, and, yeah, and, and then probably my, probably my association with the, my favorite and most famous guest was the guy that wound up coming back and inducting me into the WWE Hall of Fame was William Shatner, Captain Kirk from Star Trek, who, uh, I, right, I got to have him on a, a King's Court one night and uh, threatened to ball up my fist and knock him where no man has ever gone before and all this kind of stuff. And, and I wound up getting the famous alien monkey flip from, from William Shatner, which was, uh, you know, on the top of my list of celebrity appearances. Well, we actually, we're, we've got to wind down here because we're running out of time. Yeah. But one thing I did want to hit you guys with was the idea that they need to come by your booth. They need to get involved in Headlocked. They need to follow Mike Kingston on Twitter. And they need to go and get this book. You guys are going to be here today. You're going to be here tomorrow. Yeah, we're here all weekend. Um, Sam's here today only. Um, but both guys have uh, some really cool art you should check out. Um, Sam's doing a Dusty Rhodes picture right now. That's pretty cool. And, uh, you know, Jerry's got uh, headlock covers. He's got some, uh, some WWE stuff. And I have some art prints from the... I'm still drawing Superman. Oh, he's still drawing Superman. That's right. Since I was five years old, still drawing. And uh, we have some uh, art prints and stuff of some various... Uh, all the art at our table, though, is done by wrestlers, which I think is pretty cool. Thank you, gentlemen, so much. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you for being here.